not this event, but just what do we do? What do you, yeah, what do you do? And then we'll talk about the event. Okay. Uh, I'm Helen LaKelly Hunt, and um, I'm known for my work in women's philanthropy, um, but I, uh, I, which I did for, oh goodness, like since 1985, <clears throat> been involved in some of the early women's foundations, but um, uh, before that had met this guy, um, and he had a vision about strengthening relationships, so I proposed and uh, had sort of been a behind the scenes support of him because I care about relationship and it's a feminist issue. Well, you've been behind the scenes for a while, but in what the past 20 years at least, you've been side by side, so mm -hmm. on the scene. And we produced two books together. I'm Harville Hendricks, um, and <clears throat> Helen and I are the co creators of something called Imago Relationships Therapy, which is now distributed in about 37 countries um, around the world. About 2,500 people trained. We have about 30 trainers and a couple of hundred workshop presenters. So what we do in the world, however, right now is not couples therapy. We have extended our work into what we call relationship education for the general public, but our primary focus has been couples and families. We're now moving into other ecosystems like classrooms and congregations and corporations with that. So that's what we, that's what we do is basically we are relationship junkies and we want to help people understand that relationship, the importance of relationship and not, but not only just a relationship, but the importance of healthy relationship for everything in your life, <clears throat> for your, marriage, for your uh, children, for your work, for your body, for your immune system. It's now been pretty much established that relationship is sort of the foundation of which everything else happens or doesn't. And so that's what we do and we teach lots of people. So, and what is, um, what, what, what are safe conversations? What safe conversations? What is that that you're working on? Well, <clears throat> you want to start with that? Oh, you wanted to go ahead. Okay. So there, there's sort of two ways to talk about that. <clears throat> One is that it's a structured conversation that when people use it, they use certain sentence stems that are, make it predictable. So you know what's going to come next. Mm -hmm. And so it sort of moves you into deep uh, listening and engagement with another person who's talking. And then you take turns. So that's sort of the process of it. The definition of it that we uh, use is safe conversation is a way of talking without criticism. It's a way of listening without judging. And it's a way of connecting beyond your differences. So that's what makes a conversation safe. And then the technology is when you're talking to someone, uh, you use eye language when you're listening to that person talk, you mirror them back and then you uh, check if you got it for accuracy. Then you um, become curious about what they're saying and say, is there more about that? And that you stay in that process and you validate them. Their point of view is valid, whether you agree with them or not. And you move toward empathy. So that's the process that actualizes that definition. <coughs> so it's a, um, it, it basically says something that Helen and I have sort of, I think, a, a sort of carved out of, of four decades of working with people in more intense ways, couples and individuals, is the discovery that talking is the core of human interaction. It's and but but a, but a uh, and listening is the other side of that, and that what happens in conversation creates what happens inside you that it doesn't you don't start on the inside and go out you actually interact and that creates your inner world so we haven't known that didn't know that for the first probably 25 years of our work it finally got to be clear that people who change change the way they talked and then the things they came to talk about tend to di to disappear but if they came and talked a lot about what they came to talk about 
the thing they talked about got bigger. So it's what you focus on is what you get. We didn't know that for a long time until the brain scientists came along and said, you know, whatever you focus on, you get more of. And so therefore you want to be careful what you focus on because your brain will magnify it. So you have to decide about that. So we kind of have shifted the whole direction of the therapeutic process um, that, um, that we've done for many years toward conversation. And that means we don't have to stay in the therapy office. We can go into the public domain and have people in any context learn how to talk better and whatever they're doing will work better. So, How do you get them to believe that and not want to focus oh, on oh. their grievance? Well, one of the ways we do it is by taking them through the process. When they go through the process, we, we discovered, for instance, and Helen, I'm talking so much. Do you want to get in on this now? Or, uh, let, yeah, uh, let, may, maybe you can respond. Let to me How then, do we get people to, to do that? Say one thing yeah. that, um, that uh, another way to talk about what is this is it's a new technology, and it's a technology that's available in the therapy offices. Uh, that helps someone shift from conflict to connection. Um, and it's the technology's gotten a lot better since the 1990s because the breakthroughs in neuroscience and, and some things have just... So we're unleashing it out of the clinic and into the public because we want to create a relational value system. But Carrie, the, 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 the fascinating thing for me is, is being married to him while I was also reading the Stone Center research, the Gene Baker Miller um, um, Center on Women's Psychology and um, at Wellesley and all the early, early feminist psychologists and psychiatrists. As, as Harville and I were talking, I was also reading the feminist Psychologist, um, you know, like Carol Gilligan, and and but Jean Baker Miller and her crew just says there's no such thing as an individual. There's only an individual in relation. There's a self in relation, and the individual is a myth. And it's just like I get it stereo. I've been sitting for some time um, hearing about things that uh, the feminist psychologists are talking about, and we've. We call it safe conversations. Yeah. Um, it, it's sort of like Gloria, Gloria Steinem, if you've heard her in the last four years, she always says, we need to be linked, not ranked. And mm -hmm. I have a paper on mm -hmm. all of the variety of feminist scholarship that says we need a relational culture. And, 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 um, and that's what you, you can want it. But unless you have a technology to help hold people together uh, with their differences, uh, it's harder to actualize it. Yeah. But And that's what we're unleashing. Yeah. Yeah, I think when you say, how do you get people to uh, to want it or to agree with this, is that, that one of the things that we are surprisingly and are gratified by is that we don't just have an idea. We have a, this, as Helen said, a technology so that the idea doesn't have to become convincing. Your own body, your own words, your own interaction with another being becomes convincing. So this is we. So we do workshops, and we invite people to these workshops, and we walk them through a process in which we help them talk about different topics. But we tell them, we're just going to give you these topics. We don't care what you talk about. We care how you talk about. And here are specific sentence stems we want you to use. You can't you just can't use your own language. You have to use ours. We're tennis coaches. You know, you just can't swing your racket at a ball. You have to swing it the way we tell you. You know, you got to train that muscle until it hits the ball. Conversation is the same way. And if you have the conversation a certain way, you'll have a connection with another human being that you've never had before. And it happens. And so <laughs> then they come at the end of it and say, you know, I've never looked in my partner's eyes before. I've never felt so connected to another human being. In fact, we've done this sometimes in professional workshops where they're clinicians. And we said, okay, we want you to practice for 10 minutes. 
So talk like this, you for five minutes and then switch and you for five minutes, but pay attention to what you're doing and I'm gonna guide you through it. And therapists have turned around and said, you know, I've done therapy all my life, but I've never felt connected to another human being so quickly in my life. Nice. So the structure of the conversation and the sequence that you take people through. And then once they get the sequence, it's like the tennis thing. Once you learn how to hit the ball, you don't have to think about it anymore. You just talk that way. And then your life works. So tell me, in, in this day and age, at yeah. least I'm here in Washington, so it seems even more high fever pitch. Yeah. There are challenges within couples who may feel very different politically and it's not the way it had been in the past and people in at work and families and family members you see people you know if you're on facebook or any of that you see i saw something today where one woman said my family said i have to stop posting my political thoughts on Facebook because it's causing us to have a lot of problems. Yeah. How do you, how do you use this in a day in this day and age when you, you hear it, you hear about the, the relationship problems that are being caused? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I think maybe I'll, I'll yeah, you that. <clears throat> first we're asked that question a lot. We have been interviewed uh, what, four or five interviews this week with that question. Um, I'll mention a uh, um, there's so many ways to respond. I'm going to step back with a global, more global one. What is a relationship? Um, two people who sort of interact or whatever. Well, we are taking the time to really language that it's about two people and the space between them. And it's not what he is saying or what I am saying, but how the two <laughs> of us manage um, this between that creates a relationship. And if you want to have a good relationship, you have to learn to manage this between and you can go, well, there's nothing there. It's empty space, but actually it's replete with energy mm -hmm. fields. And so your tone of voice, it, how you phrase something, this, this um, will result in the other person either being open to your idea or um, shutting down. By, because of the way you say it. And so it, how I share my view of things <clears throat> can either um, end up with two people connected in difference or it, it can shut them down. So if I, we have something called um, how we handle negativity and it's not what you say, it's how you say it. You can bring up any issue, but in a way that doesn't make your, the person listening feel put down. And if that's moving more into, you know, shifting from judgment to curiosity as people and taking turns talking. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm throwing out a couple ideas. Harvel and I are actually publishing. It's hot off the press this <laughs> Valentine's weekend um, and throughout next week, uh, a book called The Space Between. And it's a, tech, it's a, a process to handle how to talk about anything your yeah. biggest problems, the biggest political wars, and maybe you'll say it, or how would you answer that question? Well, the, to take the concept of the space between that I was talking about and turn it into a living experience um, is to, there, there, there are four or five things that work. So, and the first thing that, that, that where we come from is difference is reality, and it's not ever going to go away. Uh, God couldn't make a copy. So <laughs> everybody is like, every leaf on a tree is different from other, every other leaf on a tree. So difference is there. So what we have to do is help people connect beyond difference. So how do you do that? And we've been working on that a long time. And the first thing is if you want to have a conversation about your view, which will be different, is you ask, is now a good time to talk about it? We call it making an appointment so that the other person can agree to be available for you to talk about it uh, or not. They may not want to talk about it. So then you don't have the conflict of talking about it. So you make an appointment, Look, which is, it's now a good time to talk about my feelings about the, the White House. Um, <clears throat> the person says, okay. So then you say, I, 
Big. Or, or they go, you know, actually now is not a good time. I've just had three of these conversations recently. <laughs> but uh, how about like, um, tomorrow, tomorrow morning yeah. or tonight at 8 o'clock? Yeah. So you actually agree to, on when you want to hear information about the other political candidate. Yeah. And, and that's the appointment. You can ask for it, but it gets set later like that, <clears throat> whenever. But the so the important thing is that, that you then say, I think. I, in other words, it's very common communication theory. Never use the word you when you're talking to somebody else because they will be defended. But if you use I think, then they don't have to react that you are describing them or that you're telling them something that they should know. The second thing is that that what we discovered is you really have to you really have to listen. And you do that by saying back what you heard in a word for word or in a paraphrase. And either way works depending on how the how the how the uh, talker would like to hear it. Because a couple, they usually have, like for instance, and a couple is always different. One person wants a paraphrase, the other one wants word for word. And, and Helen and I are very much that way. Helen likes word for word. I like paraphrases. If she paraphrases me back word for word, I feel claustrophobic. If I don't, if I don't say back to her word for word, she doesn't feel heard. So we have to stretch into each other's receptor system. But so you mirror it back, and it's a very important thing to do that. Yeah. Um, so um, so you now you're saying, let me see if I got that. If I got it, I, I, you said blah, 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 blah. And then you do a checkout. Then I get it. Now, the reason that's important is we have, we human beings, uh, according to researchers and people who study everything, every, it's amazing what people study, is the accuracy, uh, receptor accuracy. And it's 13%. That even when you're quiet and not disturbed, you're losing 87% of what you hear. And the reason is because you're running your own movie. So what's coming into your ears is having to compete with what your brain is doing. And that if you're disturbed, upset, you're losing 100% of it. So you're only listening then to your own head. So you have to check it out. Then I get it. And the person says, well, uh, you got some of it. Uh, I said, well, can you send it again? So you go back and forth until the person says, I think you got, you know, most of it. I'm, I'm okay. Then you have to say, is there more about that? Now here's where Helen talked about uh, curiosity replaces judgment. So you can't say, well, I got what you said, but it's stupid. You have to say, I got what you said. It's interesting. Is there more about it? So this is training to be safe in a conversation. Is there more about it? The person says, well, Oh uh, yeah, I got some more about it. So so the more is blah 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 blah. You mirror that back and you keep going um, until the person says, "Well, I, I think that's all I have to say about that." Now by this time, you are not in an oppositional position. You are now moving into what we call the connecting position because this person now is experiencing your interest in what they're saying. And therefore, they are not having to. Um, convince you so much so. And then you say, well, let me see if I got it all. Summary. If I got it all, you said A, B, C, and D. Then I get it all. And then you say something really amazing to them. And by the way, that is there more is the amazing question too, because most people are waiting for, you know, their turn. And if you say, is there more, uh, the person, you know, is not, can let the defense go that they have to push to get more out. But then you say, you know, that makes sense. And what makes sense about it is, and you see the sense the person who's talking is making, you not, you don't have to agree with it in your own mind, but you have to see everybody makes sense. And you have to see the sense this guy's making or this gal's making. And then you say, and I can imagine with that, you must feel uh, X, Y, and Z, angry, sad, mad, glad, scared, which is an empathic response. Then you can take turns and say, now, I like to talk, but you haven't moved this person aside while they're talking. They have now reached the end of their paragraph, their page, and now you go to your page. 
So what we do is train people to go through that process, knowing everybody makes sense, difference is reality, it ain't going to go away. And if you want to stay polarized, then argue about who's right. If you want to connect, then you have to accept each other's difference. So that's the way we help people talk about political uh, differences, that both are right. It's just that you're not connecting, but you can connect beyond difference. And then that doesn't mean you give up your point of view. It just means you give up polarizing with the other person about points of view. So that's what I would say. That's how, that's how we would help people um, who say, how do I talk about uh, political or religious uh, conversations? So do they sometimes do, is there resistance to this? Oh, oh, of course. Oh, yeah. It's like, I don't want the structure. So we say, well, how, how is not, it's like Dr. Phil says, well, how's the way you're doing it working for you? <laughs> it's, well, it's, it's not, it's not working, but uh, it's the difference to do that. I can tell stories about people who say, I don't like this structure. And then we put them through it and they agree to go through it and say, you know what? I still don't like structure, but it's the first time I've ever had a conversation like this. And you have some. Because it seems like it's not, that might be, it's not spontaneous. I, had, uh, I, I was going to answer it in the opposite way. What were you going to do? <clears throat> so, yes, it's like not spontaneous. Difference I mean, always exists. So here we I have mean, a yes, difference. people say this, but I, I, Carrie, I just cannot tell you because I was about to, I was about to answer so differently. Once people experience it, they love the structure because it's safe. Oh, yes. I mean, right. it's just like that. Everyone goes, thank God. At last, I know I can count on the other listening to me. Mm -hmm. I do so much of the listening. I mean, everyone loves it. At the beginning, the way I phrase it, it's like if you want to go skiing and you've seen videos on skiing, you're like, oh, that's so much fun. You show up at the ski place to learn to ski and what they do the snow plow, <laughs> you know, and the bunny slope. It's yes. awful. It's miserable. It's nothing fun. But yeah. you have to do that to get to the double black diamond. So that's what, we, that's what I tell people. But, oh, people love the structure. It just, it because it's safe. Yeah. You yeah. can absolutely count on uh, you know, once your partner it's good if your partner will say i'm sorry i'm not available now well what about so and so because at so and so time they're a hundred percent available and yeah. they'll listen to everything you have to say yeah. and that's true after they experience it they like it but here's what we've discovered why it works the structure tells the brain what's coming next and one of the things brain people have discovered is the brain likes predictability, does not like chaos uh, or the inability to know what's coming next. If it doesn't know what's coming next, it has to prepare for catastrophe. But the brain is paranoid. So if it doesn't know what's coming, it has to, it has to imagine that something bad is coming. <clears throat> so you're always wondering, well, what are they going to say? But if you know the next thing is going to be, is there more about that? Instead of, it's my turn now, or are you done yet? Then the brain, the, the brain of the listener and the sender goes into a synchrony because of the predictability of the flow. That structure creates that. So it's not just an emotional safety. There's actually a neurophysiological process that's triggered by predictability. So you move through the structure, you know what's going to come next, you relax, then you can actually receive more. Is that because of the, the neuro the brain's neuroplasticity? Yes. Right. Exactly because of the brain's neuroplasticity. When you're talking, your your words are activate the protein on the uh, surface of the DNA. And and that begins to change actually the library that tells the body what it is and what to do. And if that's negative energy, that protein will receive one signal, which will be an anxiety signal, and it makes the, um, the, the um, DNA more rigid. But if it's a positive signal, then there's flexibility and change. So the neuroplasticity, Helen, 
talks to, then she does the brain lectures all the time in public and talks a lot about, you want to say any more thing more about, you know about neuroplasticity? Well, just uh, one of the great insights in neuroscience is you can't change your first thought, but you can change your second. And that's very empowering because if our, if someone says something and we're reactive, well, we're going to let them have it and we're going to tell them how we feel. But it's from that lower brain if, if we're reactive in that moment to fight, flight, or freeze. Like we're going to fight them or we're going to withdraw <laughs> or freeze. And... Um, and the sentence stems, this structure of, let me see if I've got it, <clears throat> that forces you out of the lower brain into your upper brain. You have to actually, what is it, mimic or, you know, like say word for word this, and is there more, and did I get it? And by then you're liberated from the lower brain. Up here, this part of the brain, the neocortex, you can problem solve. Mm -hmm and collaborate <clears throat> and cooperate. Down here, the reactive part of the brain is, it's my way or the highway. Like, you you need to see my point of view, or you just, you're an idiot, you know? Mm -hmm. How can anyone take your point of view? And, um, but the upper brain, you may very much disagree at the end, but you don't have to have split and damaged your relationship just because you believe in, you have a different, political perspective than the other. Well, do you think that the, do you think you're going to see a number of, um, a number of couples where this is an, is an issue? Cause I keep hearing, I do hear it. Tell me about that. Yeah. We, well, we don't have an active couples therapy practice right now because we're doing this, uh, these big projects at the relationship education level. But we have this network of a couple of thousand therapists and we are online with them. And it's really the case that they are all talking to each other about how they are dealing with the, the impact of the political situation on the couples. And that is one of the most disturbing things that couples are bringing in the office now. It's, it's kind of surprising to me because as, when I was active, nobody ever had a conflict much over politics. They had conflict over sex or you know, or money or stuff like that, but politics. Uh, and but now it's amazing that this new political situation has polarizing couples and families all all across the country. So these two thousand people every day I read, you know, somebody else who's come in, what we did with it, how we working with it. But the interesting thing is they're all using the dialogue process, and they're finding that the people who come in totally polarized go out understanding that difference exists, everybody's valid, and what we need to do is respect each other's difference and hold that without polarizing. And um, and then they find they're beginning to talk about other things more, better what, once you can talk about this thing. But yes, it's all across the country. And as Helen said earlier, this, this week in particular is a high media week for us because of the big events coming up. And every person who's interviewed us has started off with, tell us a little bit about how do you deal with the political impact, the political situation's impact on couples and families? And, you know, that's a totally new question that we've never gotten before in the history of the world. That's, that's really amazing. Now, one other thing I do want to ask you about, you've been doing work with the Dallas, with Dallas communities and right. with the Dallas police. How does the Imago therapy help um, create better communities? Mm -hmm. That way. Yeah, you want to do that? Like any other ecosystem. Uh, the mayor here in Dallas, when we first met with him about a year, about two years ago, said, oh, wow, you know, this belongs in every organization in the city of Dallas. He is actually on a video, him saying that. And um, and some people get this. It's the, some people, other people will go, oh, this is marriage enrichment. And we're really a, a, a kin to all the feminist visionaries who say, you know, it's not about the patriarchy. You know, it's not about monologue. It's about dialogue. It's not about the vertical, top-down, power, not power. It's about power with, not power over. And this kind of technology teaches a couple power with. But anyway, the police um, highest 
a divorce rate in of any profession in the country, highest suicide rate within fam couples marriages in the country, um, and uh, not only did they after seven seven July seventh shootings. They brought us in to um, do workshops with first responders and their spouses. And they also, with that being su successful, they we are continuing and they're getting us certified to share this to police associations throughout Texas. But they also want this in the training for new police on how to deal with someone, as, as they were telling us, say the guy walks into the food mark walks out with a turkey, gets in his car and drives away with the police, sees it and goes, Zoom. and the, the policemen who were telling us about this said, and when he gets out of the car, it's a turkey for God's sake. It's only <laughs> a turkey. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to talk real badly to this person who stole their, this turkey. You know, they need to, you know, you need to use compassion. So police are, uh, at least the police, we have been called in to help they want this taught uh, in a way that they'll relate to people in the streets better. We were really surprised because we had such a, the first workshop was with the police families. And so we weren't surprised at all about that because we know this works with couples, no matter who and what and where, what economic level or professional level. What we were surprised is that they said, can you come back and do a longer workshop because we want to get this accredited in our curriculum for police to learn how to talk to the public? And I looked at Helen and said, we didn't even have to market it that way. <laughs> you know, we knew it would work, but they saw it would work. And so it's now part of their curriculum. So how does it work? So how was, is, does it work when only one person has been trained? Well, it, what it does is the person who has been trained is the person who talks in such a way that they don't provoke the other person's anxiety. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, so and that's, it's very disarming. I mean, we, we like when we're in Walmart at the checkout counter, uh, we will typically like mirror the person at the checkout counter uh, when we're in the deli and someone you know, brings our food and Harma loves talking to waitresses and waiters and just conversing with them and, and being pleasant to them. And it's just a way to brighten people's day is to mirror them back and go, let me see if I got that. Is there, and, you know, if I got it, you said so-and-so. And is there more about that? Oh, well, that is really interesting. And people feel really uh, respected. <clears throat> yeah. And so what's happening this week? Well, tell me about what's happening this weekend. This weekend. Well, this weekend, we will be at in Dallas at the Fair Park, which is the big uh, arena. Um, and But we, we're not filling the arena. We're filling uh, the automotive building with about, what, 600 people, I think, will be there, uh, in which we will do a stellar presentation with nine cameras and so forth because it's going to be streamed globally. And so uh, we will be there for about five hours uh, from 10 to five, 10 to four, um, doing a workshop that the focus will be on couples and the family with the bridge over that this also works if you're single and you can come if you're single because you want to also talk. And it also works in other ecosystems that, that you might want to take it to, but our language will be directed, directed at couples. So we'll start and go from um, 10 to five. We actually start at nine with some preliminaries and, um, and stream it across the world and people can download it. It'll also be um, uh, saved so that people in different time zones can plug into it in their time zone. And it also will be on demand, I think for about 10 days after that. And you're doing this for free. And we're doing it for free and you can download the manual, if you want to do it in your home. We well, have a lot of people who are bringing small groups into their homes or in or some therapists into their offices. They can download a manual and go through the manual with us. They can also download an app, and it's all free. Let and, me um, let me yeah. mention uh, for de a couple decades, we've been doing an eight an eight hundred. Uh, we've been doing an eighteen hour workshop 
at Omega Kripala Human Potential Centers. It cost eight hundred and fifty dollars for uh, to pay to come, not counting your housing and whatever. And people come from all over the world to these workshops. We decided to condense this eight eight hundred and fifty dollar workshop and uh, give it away uh, for free uh, in five hours. And we actually have the essence of the workshop. It's psychoeducation and um, and you know it, it, we, we take them from start to finish in the workshop we're fast and the couples love it and um, so it's a it's sort of an honor it's again uh, what, what keeps me up at night is that um, we, if we can get this out like it's so good but you have to pay for money and you shouldn't have to pay for money to get this stuff it is simple <laughs> to mm. we see people so affected by it and um and there's just this feeling that you know with especially with what's going on in washington that paradigm is not right that you know, I'm going to win if I'm the loudest and I shout the loudest and I threaten the most. That's how you, that's who wins. Ah, you know, there's, um, so we feel really, really honored to get this out because, because we know we'll prevent so much unnecessary suffering in families, but the culture needs this to do what Gloria is saying, being linked, not ranked and yeah. creating a relational world. And I think that to add to that, we're doing it. We're not just doing it because we're goody two shoes, wanting to help you know more people feel better. We actually are taking aim at the value system of the culture itself, which is focused on the individual and on uh, individualism, and are saying that we need to replace that with a new relational value system, where relationality is foundational and equity belongs to everybody instead of there being this competitive uh, top-down, this is a lateral where collaboration works. So we're actually aiming at changing the value system of the culture, but you can't do it without changing the minds and hearts of people. So we start with the individual, start with the individual couples and families and schools and people local and it'll go global. Maybe, maybe, maybe. we don't know. I mean, we don't, we don't know how global it's gonna be, but it's available, we're practicing, getting this out. <laughs> well, Helen keeps saying, if not in our lifetime, uh, someday we will have- In the book. next we lifetime, will, if the it next doesn't time. happen. Because well, it, it's destiny. One day we'll be talking more respectfully to each other. We certainly hope so. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time and good luck.